think we'll go ahead and get started. I want to make sure we start on time because we've got lots of good, good stuff to cover. Um, my name is Shereen Schrock. I work here at Illinois Wesleyan. And I am just thrilled to be here today at this Back to College class. I'm so thankful that so many of you came came out in this rainy, gloomy weather. And I think we've got a great panel. One of our panelists is still coming. He's just running a bit late. Um, so we'll have a great panel for you this afternoon. And we want to leave some time at the end for questions. So um, it is my honor to introduce to you all um, our three panelists who are here, Richard Muirhead, class of 66 and Mary Melcher, uh, Mary Harris, you may know her as, um, class of 70, and also um, Winona um, Whitfield from the class of 70 as well. And so they're gonna be sharing some of their experiences from their times here at Illinois Wesleyan that shaped their social consciousness, and also talking about a legendary visit that happened on our campus 50 years ago. So I will turn over our time to them. Thank you very much, and join me in thanking them for being here. Thank you. It's uh, good to be back. It's been a few years for me, and it's good also to meet my panelists here. Uh, I'm much older. I graduated before they arrived, so uh, I've heard about them, though. Um, yeah, I'm Richard Meir, and I graduated in 66. Our, it's one classmate here, and the other classmates? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Wow. What a memory, eh? Good, good. Granny told me you were coming. <laughs> Anyhow, um, yeah, I graduated in 66, and uh, when I, I got a, a, an email from Adrian earlier this summer talking about the, trying to put this panel together because of the 50 years of Martin Luther King's visit. And it's been fun because ever since then, I've been thinking and reading and going back. I have all of the old artists for the year, the yearbook. I've gone uh, through all of this stuff and reading and looking at pictures of people who are significantly younger than we are now. But um, I, uh, I wanted to start by just talking a little bit about the context, what things were like uh, from my point of view, at least in, 19, in the 60s. Um, we think we had 14 African-American students. That was a number we always threw out there. It may not have been that many, because I've gone through the yearbook and I can't find 14. Uh, that was probably a stretch. We said 14, but I think it was less. Um, and uh, the situation on campus, too, was such that, many of you remember, social life was uh, always centered around the Greek life. And for African-American students, that was particularly problematic, because our Greek life was totally segregated. Um, I somehow was talked into running for students at a president, and somehow I won. And it was a great experience for me because it put me on committees with a lot of faculty members. And so I got to know people like Emily Dale, James Whitehurst, uh, others who really pushed us. Uh, yeah, I wish they were here. Um, and we were on, I was on a human uh, relations commission for the college. And we came up with a statement, which I'm going to share with you in just a moment, which was a belief statement. Now, I've spent my career in education. I've worked at several colleges. And all colleges have belief statements. I mean, Wesleyan has a set of, you know, there's a mission, there's a vision. Who are we? What do we believe in? And that's what we were asking for. It was a statement of support for an integrated society. Well, it was hard to integrate when you only had 14, maybe fewer students, but it was also hard um, because of the de facto kind of segregation that was going on in the 60s. Um, so we came up with a statement, and I'm going to put it up. You'll read it. It is not very controversial by today's standards, but it was in the day. Oh, by the way, the, this is out of the yearbook. Notice this. The controversial Dr. Martin Luther King. <laughs> Okay, Malcolm X, maybe, but not Martin Luther King. <laughs> Bill Beck, definitely controversial, <laughs> but not Martin Luther King. Um, now, this is, this is my fun one. Skip Gilbert with Ross Barnett. So we came up with this statement, and we sent it out to all of the student organizations, the 
uh, newspaper, the, uh, the social clubs, the, the uh, asking people to see if they could sign that, to subscribe to this belief statement. It's nothing terribly radical. You can imagine the uproar in 1965 and 66 when this hit the press. In the Argus, I found articles that we've written. Some of us who are involved in student government wrote articles supporting this, asking why can't we just put our names on this. Next to it was an editorial from the Argus saying that uh, things take time and that when, the, when people are ready, then they will move on it. But it was a, there was tremendous resistance. Our question was, is it the right thing to say that we believe in this? Is this something we can support? Others said, well, what's going to happen? I mean, what if, uh, what if we don't sign it? Will we be thrown off campus? And our question again was, why can't you sign it? Why can't you support this? Some of our language is a little, little dated, but that's, that's where we were. Um, so the other thing that struck me when I went through this, and this uh, I hadn't thought about for years, but when I went through the Argus and I read some of the old editorials from the Argus, from some of the student organizations from some of the administrators here on campus who were applauding the students for having blood drives as opposed to uh, to protesting against the Vietnam War. Now blood drives are a very good thing and those are the things we probably should have been doing and we were doing but there was a real lid on this whole notion of protest and we began to protest and that's where this all fits in. Um, I also wanted to say, um, you know, who were some of the people? I mentioned Emily Dale, Jim Whitehurst, Dr. Stachnik. Uh, uh, going through the Ar Argus, I found faculty members I didn't even know who wrote letters to the editor saying, we've been through this battle, we were through this battle, I was on a committee in 1958, we should be not talking about this, it should be done, taken care of, and over, and it's not. So there was a frustration, it, go it predates our group. but. We were slow to act on it. Um, oh, so Emily Dale. Uh, how many of you remember Emily? Everybody. She. Uh, I'm just going to give you one example of. You know, and I talked for 42 years, um, but this is a moment that hopefully you've all had sometime at some point in your academic career. You remember where you were, and what she said, and what how it impacted you. I was taking a minority relations class from Emily, and she brought up the topic of Rosa Parks. She had, didn't know where she should be sitting on the bus. And she asked what the students thought about it. And I was very shy. I didn't want to venture an opinion on it. Somebody in the classroom said, uh, well, she should have worked through the system to change the laws. And I said, she, she forced me. She said, and what do you think, Mr. Mayorhead? And I said, if she hadn't moved to the front of the bus, she'd still be sitting on the back of the bus. 20 years after that, Emily said that was a moment she remembered about me, certainly the moment I remembered about her. So there were faculty members um, that helped us, but there were also many of our peers. Uh, Skip, how many of you remember Skip? Ever remember him being late for anything? <laughs> Skip called an hour ago. Just leaving Rockford. I had lunch with Skip about a month ago, and we pulled up Martin Luther King's speech that many of you heard in 1966. Martin Luther King, if you remember, started out by saying, well, first of all, he arrived late, and he said, I left Chicago late because it was foggy, but I would rather be Martin Luther King late than the late Martin Luther King. <laughs> so when Skip called me a, a bit ago, he said, you can share that Martin Luther King story. He's uh, uh, Skip Gilbert late. Uh, yeah, he might make it by the end of this thing. Um, some of you remember Greg Dell. I've been in touch with Jade. You remember Jade? Um, Greg is in uh, advanced stages of Parkinson's, and he's, um, he can no longer talk. He may be aware, he may not be aware. Uh, <clears throat> but it was people like Greg, Skip, and other students who I think helped us support one another when we took some risks. And so it was faculty, it was our peers, and it was kind of an exciting period. 
And then, I just want to leave one other thought. Oh, something that uh, um, I haven't shared this with a lot of people. I think my brother Jack can share the stories, and my wife can share the stories. This is my wife, Isabel, who I met when I was in the Peace Corps in Peru. And my sister, Lola Pam, that many of you remember. Um, the, um, when Martin Luther King came, that was through the convocation program, and so the Senate was kind of a, you know, we announced that he was coming. There were a lot of students who were very involved in making that happen. I had essentially nothing to do with it. I would like to take credit for it, but I couldn't. Skip, uh, through his father, who was a Baptist minister, had some context, and some other people had context. <clears throat> so King came. But because the student senate was uh, identified as the host, I received hate uh, calls, hate mail. Um, I had to borrow an old car from my parents because I was doing student teaching that semester. I had the N lover uh, written on the side of my car. I had a call three in the morning one night from uh, what appeared to be an older woman asking why we had invited, how dare we invite the controversial Martin Luther King. And so that was kind of intimidating, but also quite an election for a farm boy, quite a, a lesson for a farm boy in 1966. And then, uh, just I'll, I'll just leave it at that, after I left here, three months later I was in the Peace Corps in Peru in a village where I didn't speak Spanish. And, and there's a lot of history between then and now, and maybe we can talk afterwards. Uh, I do speak Spanish now, by the way. Uh, and I'm going to put one more slide up that you will enjoy. So since Skip isn't here, does anybody remember this? <laughs> Ross Barnett was the, the governor of Mississippi, and he was kind of the poor man's George Wallace. He was... Uh, you know, I mean, we've got many people I think have forgotten him, but those of us who are a little older do remember him. And you read his this article, you can maybe see it. That he, the South is coming back, the tide has turned, and Skip seems to be enjoying this more than Ms. Governor Barnett. He was clearly <laughs> uncomfortable. In the question and answer question, uh, questioning, they asked, um, and he said, "No, it's coming back." He said, he turned to one of the students, who asked the question, and said would you want your sister to marry a Negro? So, I'll just leave it at that for now. Look at the byline. We have the author with us. Oh my God! <laughs> Steve, raise your hand. Wow. You did a nice job on that article. I remember being there, but I don't remember writing the article. Well, you should. I did notice a couple typos, but this was before with spell check and stuff like that. And I left in June of 66, and these fine young women arrived in the fall of 66, so I just met them. I have to tell you, for years, I have heard about Dr. Bushnell. I did not have the pleasure of meeting him until this very moment. <laughs> Talk to Steve, he wrote the article. <laughs> if, I don't, if you don't mind my seat, I'll stay. Um, what was interesting, um, they indicated that uh, we have a surprise guest introducing us, and the first thing I thought of was Dr. Bushnell. Uh, I came to Wesleyan in 1966. And uh, my co-hosts here, they have notes and, and information, and they say we're going to talk about when Dr. King came to campus. <laughs> and I was trying to think back, and so later I found out it was prior to my arrival. <laughs> and the, the thought, though, was what did that turn of events that they just talked about uh, have to do with how I got to Wesleyan? And apparently, it was because it was an all-out out effort from this point forward to recruit back then, what you call it? Negroes. Which, um, Steve, so yeah. Steve may have written the article. In the article <laughs> there's an article that said, IWU students to recruit Negroes. Okay. So, so, I went to Morgan Park High School in Chicago, and um, 
if you look at some of the old articles in the archives, um, they went to other high schools in Chicago. But someone was out recruiting because I heard about Wilbur Gessner <coughs> from someone who visited um, our camp, um, our campus because we had a little small high school campus, and it fit what I was about. I was um, active in the what we call student senate, you know, secretary of the class, and. But the makeup of the school was similar. It was only a couple of thousand, well, 1,800 students, uh, primarily uh, Caucasian. I'd say maybe 15, 20% black back in that time. Uh, we had a strong athletic uh, set of teams. So we were known for uh, winning uh, football, basketball. And so the African American students, you know, geared toward that. But the one thing that was interesting, the colors were green and white. <laughs> and they were green and white at Wesleyan, and I went to uh, Chicago Kemper Law School, they were green and white then. So I never had to change colors, all my <laughs> books are the same, so uh, I've enjoyed that. But, so the recruitment was, it wasn't geared toward come to this lovely campus, you know, um, it'll meet your lifestyle, anything like that. It actually dealt with more of my academic um, thoughts. I was a French major. You know, um, now they have what back international baccalaureate tracks. We had honors tracks. Um, we hadn't even started the AP tracks at that point in time. So I'd taken five years of everything, so I didn't want to take anything else. I didn't want to be a chemist, I didn't want to be a biologist, I didn't want to teach history. So I was a French major with those other five students. That <laughs> uh, and took and since I'd taken French all of high school, I only had to take like two or three classes. I had to make classes up. There were three people in the class, um, so I was able to enjoy myself. So, but I came from Chicago. I had a family of eight uh, sisters and brothers, so I was glad to get away, stay <laughs> on a small campus, and um, be with my. Huh? And I was. I came to Wesleyan in 16. Oh, wow. So I was the youngest in our class um, for a long time. Uh, and when I arrived, the African American students, we spied each other. And our group was 16, I believe, at the time. Later I found out, maybe about two hours later, we doubled the class of African Americans in uh, Illinois Wesleyan. I don't know what those 14 were, but they were high the so much. <laughs> and, um, but didn't have any unpleasant experiences because since I was the youngest, uh, and uh, when Ola talked about some other things, things didn't phase me at all. I had, um, I, I looked at this audience, and this is how the audience looked then. <laughs> um, this audience was similar in my high school. Because uh, I can remember graduation, my father saying, why are you on the stage? I said, because I'm the same. Because that's how the audience looked. So Wesley didn't look different from, from what I was accustomed to in everything except my immediate home life and friends and family, church, etc. So I was okay, except I didn't take much for everything. So when I came to Wesley and, and we walked around and saw that there well, only 16 more of us. So we banded together, yes. But if anything ever seemed to be out of sorts, they would say, Mary, you know, did you talk to Winona? Did you talk to Mark? Did you talk to so-and-so? And we would um, make sure that things were righted as they need be. Uh, the student senate did a lot of it because none of us were uh, shy about speaking up about anything. Um, I found myself teaching little life, life lessons um, and just a few anecdotes that, that would come up. We talked about the fact that where do you go and get your hair done? Because you had to walk a long way into Bloomington to find where that black hairstyle was. So I probably didn't get my hairstyle much during that time. Um, I lived in Muscle Hall, and um, I remember the floor, um, Penny Allison, Sherry Olson, 
those are names that have gone to different reunions and remember. So little things like you go to, and all of us, because I've traveled back and forth on Route 56, you go to uh, truck stops on the way, get your car filled, um, get a little bite to eat and take up a little item that's uh, significant of that area as a souvenir you take it home. So one of the students had a uh, little brown doll. And the brown doll was um, from South, well, some Southern state, with a little bowl of cotton. And I'd seen those when I would go. My, my family's from Alabama. So I would see those in the little stores. And um, Winona can remember, she doesn't know the story, but she can remember, I would, I would laugh. I laugh freely, and I would cry. I would sit and just tear up, you know, in, in a minute, just laughing at people. But I sat there, and the person couldn't figure out why I was crying. I said, I'm not crying, I'm laughing. They said, why are you laughing? The doll sat on her bureau chest. It had the little bowl of cotton, and it had a little gingham dress on or something like that, brown face, um, yarn, black hair, and it had brown feet. With those shoes. And I just sat there and I kept looking at it and I just couldn't do anything but laugh. And she said, Why are you laughing? I said, Because you know what brown is. They're <laughs> flesh colored just like your words. <laughs> so it, it was little things like that that we would share with each other as time went on. Um, and because I was the type of person that anyone could get along with, they would ask me a question. Well, why do they do that? Or why do you do that? So I was my own ambassador. I later, the first year at Munsell, I wound up having a single room because my room was that. And then after that, I was an RA. So I was the type of person who could share things with persons. Um, Winona may fit some of them. We didn't have, like I said, we didn't have bad experiences. We had to, free uh, blooms and uh, normal of, of little things we thought weren't necessary. And um, so if I look up here, Dr. Bushnell, you know, don't report me later. <laughs> but um, there were little things in front of person's yards that we didn't think we could belong to. Them. <laughs> and, uh, the initials were YDs and we would just go through the community and just take them. And in 1968, when uh, I think it was, um, Robert Kennedy was assassinated, and he did riots, and uh, the community at that point in time thought, all oh, those 39 black students might act up. What did we get? We got the black house. That um, made us know that our community was conscious of what needed to be done. So someone out there that, that worked with Dick and Winona and Mark and, and Roy and we had these different talks. Things went on in our community that many of us didn't know, many of you didn't know, that made sure that we were trying to meet the needs of all the communities. It wasn't just African American community, later it was Asian communities, uh, the African Native uh, communities, the Hispanic communities. And there was always a, a layer of, of persons who were actively working to make sure that there were no obstacles. And if we saw something out of order, we confronted it right then and there so that we didn't have problems that many campuses did. And I think that worked to our advantage over those years. I'll pass on to Ms. Thank, Thank you for coming. Uh, let me begin by publicly thanking Dick Muirhead and Skip Gilbert for their efforts during the time before Mary and I enrolled at Wesleyan in the fall of 1966. I was only vaguely aware of their efforts of bringing additional students of color to the campus and creating a welcoming and hospitable uh, environment. Let me say that my four years at Wesleyan were like a perfect storm. 
there were so many issues to confront. I really wonder how I managed to graduate in four years. Uh, there were three issues that occupied my time. First of all, the women's issue. In 1966, Wesleyan still had women's hours. I grew up in a family, I'm the youngest and the only girl with three older brothers. So I had confronted issues about gender all my life. <laughs> and for those of you who were too young, women's hours meant that women students had to be in the dorm, locked behind the door, at 10.30 on weekdays and 12.30 or 1 on weekends. I can't remember because I was out most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> Men, students did not have to go inside because the theory was that once you put the women in, the men would naturally go in. <laughs> well, Illinois State University was the first major university in the country to abolish women's hours. And that happened during our freshman year. So there went the theory of the men will go in. Uh, the second issue was the Vietnam War. I have, as I said, three older brothers, and two of my brothers were in Vietnam while I was at Wesleyan. Uh, Wesleyan was full of uh, conservative, hawkish students, all of whom thought the war was good. And as Dick mentioned, did things like have a blood drop. Uh, well, they had 2S status. Uh, and so it was, it was easy to be in favor of the war when you were not going yourself. Uh, and this culminated in some, 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 one thing that I will mention. <coughs> um, a group of us, and I can't remember how many, at our graduation had a silk dream done of a peace symbol with a fist in the middle of it and put that on our motor boards. And there were several faculty, including the chair, I think, of the sociology department, my department, who refused to walk in the graduation ceremony because of this rather uh, obvious sign of protest. Uh, the third issue was race, of course, and the status of minority students and African Americans generally. Confronting individual and institutional racism was a challenge that I fully embraced. Now, I must say there were some things that Wesleyan did right in regards to race and racism on campus. Uh, by the time we graduated in 1970, I think there were probably 35, 40, perhaps even more African American students on campus. Not so many uh, Hispanic students or international students that came later. And the group of students came from all over the country. There were some from the Midwest, but also a good number from the Northeast and the South. And that diversity of students uh, allowed us to learn and support each other, which I think is very important. There were no African-American faculty or staff. There was no diversity coordinator. So we relied on each other. I want also to say that Dr. Robert Eckler the president during my last two years of Wesleyan seemed genuinely, genuinely accepting of the demands and requests of minority students. Uh, he couldn't change, however, everything about Bloomington or the campus. Uh, culturally, there were many students who had never had any interaction with students of color. I can recall one incident as a freshman or sophomore where members of a fraternity here on campus were celebrating their annual uh, weekend. And this white fraternity placed themselves in the center of the campus 
and they painted themselves with blackface. And they had, as part of their celebration, a watermelon spitting contest. Uh, and they had basically sort of a minstrel show. Now, obviously, the members of the fraternity had never had any contact with black students or adults who could have told them this was inappropriate. Okay. Uh, the greater Bloomington community was also not necessarily welcoming to students. One of our classmates, later my roommate, needed to have a tooth pulled. And this was when she was a freshman. We were all freshmen. She went to Nurse Arnold, <laughs> who was the nurse on campus. That was the health service. And Nurse Arnold directed her to a local dentist who was only a couple of blocks away. Well, he, she went to the dentist, and upon her arrival, he told her he couldn't treat her because he had, quote, Mennonite patients who would not understand. Well, she came back to the dorm and told me, and of course, I, I couldn't let that go. I, I uh, made some calls to Chicago and to the, we didn't have a state human relations commission at that time, but we did have the Chicago human relations commission. And I didn't even know what a minute night was. At that time. Uh, but the bottom line is, along with the help of Dick's brother, uh, we were able to prove his discriminatory conduct and force the university to take, remove his name from those recommended uh, list of dentists. And I think uh, soon after that, he retired. Uh, how did confrontation of these and other issues affect me in my later pursuits? Well, I became the first president of the Black Students Union I think I served two years. And one of the things I learned from this experience is how to mediate disputes. Uh, I also learned how to organize people towards a common goal. And after I left Wesley and I became a community organizer in East St. Louis, and I think the skills that I gained at Wesley helped me in those endeavors. A second thing I learned was how to use facts and persuasively argue a point. I've always been one to argue, but uh, the necessity of facts was something I had to master. Uh, I became a law professor and taught others to persuasively argue the facts. A third thing I learned was to be cognizant of events outside of my own sphere. Remember, we were at Wesleyan during the days before email, Snapchat, Twitter, Facebook, and the internet. We obtained the news from reading the newspaper <laughs> and watching the evening news. And I can remember there was there would always be a copy of the Chicago Tribune, the Sun-Times, the Daily News, at the student center or at the library, and I read the paper. And, and through that, we all became better informed about the issues that other students were confronting all over the country, just as we uh, were here. And lastly, you have to remember that this was the days before college sports became so big. Uh, and so I look now, I've been, I, I've been my, my life passion is sort of participation. I've been um, uh, involved with voter and election uh, laws for some time. And I look at Mississippi, Alabama, and their football teams and think in my lifetime, there, those students could not have stepped onto the campus, let's go lead the football team. Uh, and yet we have some of the same issues uh, confronting 
students of color today on campus and outside of campus that we did in 1966. So, Wesleyan, all in all, was a perfect storm, but I'm glad that I was weathered. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're into a lot of this, just like that uh, paper up there shows. Um, it wasn't the fact sometimes of what we felt, but what we knew. Uh, the first 11 years of my life, my parents rented from a black couple. And uh, if it hadn't been for them, they wouldn't have been able to stay where they had been and, and do what they wanted to do at that time. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Wilson, I still remember them, and they were great. And I'd come down here and 
some of this thing started to happen, I went, what the hell is going on? Excuse me. But I didn't know, and then I started seeing the TB, the uh, uh, Selma and, and Birmingham and so forth. And I think a lot of us uh, here in the West and probably didn't really understand or know what was really happening at that time. Once it did start to come out, that's what I think happened, that the people would say, well, wait a minute, what, what the heck's going on here? You know, and, and started to try and do something about it. So I think it's the, um, the media today, I think, has a lot to explain and stand up for. But back then, I think this is one reason uh, that a lot of this started to happen around us, because I went over to McGill because I wanted to see the place that I saw Kennedy uh, give us an idea of the Cuban Missile Crisis, et cetera. And, uh, the TV was gone out of the room, but then I found out there's a TV in every room. <laughs> so it uh, wasn't any big deal. But I think that's, that's one of the big reasons it happened, because everybody was finally able to see and could not say that, oh, what do you mean, this doesn't happen anymore, etc. So I think uh, that's one reason why it happened. And I know uh, even at that, uh, one of my best friends in the Air Force, when it started out, uh, he was one of the first uh, uh, African-American uh, pilots straight out of pilot training to get the front seat of at that time, which was the best part of it, four. But when he went to the base to sign in, he went to the uh, office to get a room at the base while they were looking for a house. And the uh, enlisted at the desk looked up and says, uh, enlisted people go down here to the next office, and his wife says it took every ounce of strength he could to keep him from climbing over that desk. But uh, even at that time, which was you know back in the early 70s, then it was still there. But uh, I think if, if people do know and they actually look and see uh, the truth, like the lady said, facts, uh, it's it's going to help. I mean, it did back then, and hopefully, it just continues. I was a member of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee in uh, the South, having joined the Nashville. It sounds awfully bright down there. <laughs> <laughs> There's a good reason to speak over here. Stand over to the right. Uh, I think I'm safe now. institutions 
the word candidates for conversion to the active resistance. And, and then I discovered, as I was saying to most of the people in my class, that um, there was a very important student, black student leader in that class, James Lawson. Jim Lawson was a fine, fine student. And he had been particularly strong in addressing the students at the sit-in conference that was held in Raleigh, North Carolina. I went with the, uh, with the delegation from Nashville. And there were a couple of us who were parts of that conference. And that was the place where things began to come together. Students organizing for resistance. And it was interesting because it was a movement that was partly motivated by King, but if you didn't know the, the territory, you wouldn't have realized how many others there were. The leaders of black women were there. And it's very interesting that these leaders came together, and some of them wanted to recruit the, the sit-in troops to, to help strengthen their causes and their campaigns. And others were a little bit more interested in simply motivating this generation of students to, to get out and to do something face the outright and publicly expressive racism that we saw in so many places in the South. You all remember the guy with the axe handle that wouldn't want blacks to come to his restaurant. And uh, of course he was inviting uh, outrage and inviting physical confrontation and, and the real danger. But there were so many more issues than that. And the, the, uh, that, that's the, the first place I met Martin Luther King. So he gave a good talk to the, to the students. And, uh, but I, I wasn't sitting back and soaking it out. I was one of them absorbing this for the first time. And our student from Nashville, Jim Lawson, was the one who perhaps made the strongest case at that conference. And he, and he his theme there was, we are trying to raise the moral issue. All right. Yes. There needs to be that kind of focus on the issues these days. We are trying to raise the moral issue. What we have been denied, what we have been pushed aside, even jailed for, and of course eventually get the, the buses put on fire the, after the sit-ins had gotten started and the end of the interstate transportation of agitators. Agitators, to think that being an agitator can get you in trouble. Good um, schools do agitate students, that's what they do. They stir them up. They change minds. Most of all, they change focus. 
what is the issue this generation needs to face. And there's no question that what that, what that was the issue that was really being confronted in a great many ways by the largely black student congregation. So it was kind of interesting to see Jim Lawson more, more interestingly probed and followed by the students than Martin Luther King. And he was, of course, dealing with a great many black parents, many families, many leaders. There's a whole generation being challenged, as there is today. And it's interesting that from that, they organized. Uh, it was so interesting to see black feminists organizing in the midst of this. Some of the great contributors to the movement. And there were other people who were uh, learning to, to organize, learning to oppose, to challenge, to throw spokes in the wheels of social change. And so this was a, this was a learning experience of completely in, engaged me. And when I needed a job, and I saw that Wesley had an opening in the history department, I decided to apply. But when I came here and saw and heard about the the different features of the community, I realized that one of my college jobs might have disturbed people more than my job in, in, in civil rights. Because I had been a union member in a steel products factory. And that was dangerous. How could you really want to bring that person in? And uh, I didn't, I didn't go over that much. <laughs> I thought the AFL-CIO was pretty good sounding organization, wages were better. And, and of course, Wesleyan was looking for somebody that would contribute more to the campus dialogue about the issues of race. And fortunately, the dean and the president, Roy Berto, were interested in that and thought that I probably wouldn't explode. <laughs> <laughs> and we're so grateful that, that they did. And I <laughs> Some of the others were Luther Bedford and Ray Morgan. 
Now, if, if you know uh, anything about, let's say, the tales of sports in Illinois, Luther Bedford was uh, a, a coach of no at Marshall High School. Marshall High School dominated basketball for quite a while, but he was a graduate of Illinois Western University, came from Rockford, Illinois. The person who really preceded me here at Illinois Wesleyan, who was a part of that same legacy, was one Laverne Witt. Laverne came here in 1959 and 1960, graduated in 1963. He was a physics and mathematics major. He was president of the senior class, member of Blue P, Green Medallion. He did it all. And it was that legacy that brought me here to Illinois Wesleyan. Now, I, yes, I played football, I ran track, but let me add something to this. Dr. Bushnell has talked about the segregation in the South. Because I was involved in athletics, I experienced the, the segregation right here in the state of Illinois. On the track and field team, uh, we, we went down to Principia College or one of the colleges nearby, but we had to pass through Tazewell County or a town called Beacon, Illinois. Beacon, Illinois had sundown laws. And Coach Keck said, well, Skip, I guess you better scoot down a little bit. And uh, that was because, literally, Pam, I had, I was, as this, you see this? I am representing the only, well, diversity in my class of 1967. I came here in 1963. So I was the only African-American male in my class. So at that time, I was the only, uh, African American on that uh, track team. So as we rolled through Pekin, Illinois, I knew about the sundown laws. I knew what sound, sundown laws were. Yes, I did scoot down in the car. My teammate protected me. Uh, and after we left that area, I sat back up in the seat. Now, you know, Dr. Bushnell has talked about Nashville, Mr. Axehandle Maddox, and a number, number of those people in the South but I experienced a lot of that right here in the state of Illinois. So I just wanted to share that with you. I didn't want you to get the geographics mixed up. <laughs> okay? All right. Oh, oh, that's why. Okay. Yeah, that's a picture of me here. At, uh, I was down in Illinois State. And that's one of um, our esteemed uh, civil rights um, adversaries, uh, Ross Barnett, governor of the state of Mississippi. And uh, he spoke there at uh, Illinois State University, and Dick was among the groups, and he would we go up and get his autograph. He said, yeah, you won't know who I am. So uh, I was wearing a sport coat, and I would wear a shirt and tie. It was called the politics of respectability. Now young people come in, you know, polos and t-shirts, uh, but there I was in my wardrobe of respectability because I had that on, Dr. Barnett, or Mr. Barnett, Governor Barnett signed that book, and incidentally, I was in the Illinois State Yearbook that year as well. <laughs> so, uh, I just wanted to share that. <laughs> hey, I, I should say something about the next step. When I was at a history meeting, or, or was it in the um, one of the men who had been a black leaders in the basketball team, and uh, I think had wanted to tell me that he was offered a fine fellowship to get him all the way to the PhD at the University of Mississippi. And he wondered, well, how would I respond to that? You know, they're willing to pay you to get PhD there. Sounds like good money to me. <laughs> He's now dean of the business school at one of the Florida State Universities. He came through just fine. And, and he enjoyed talking about that, too. Thank you so much.